Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today we are taking an in-depth look at how to build a totem warrior barbarian for D&D 5e. Barbarians are a popular choice in Dungeons & Dragons for those who want to play a brute force who can stand up on the front lines and deal out a ton of damage. But the Totem Warrior presents a really interesting option that lets you customize a few of the abilities that you gain along the way and choose how you're going to engage in different aspects of the game. The Path of the Totem Warrior stands out as one of the few Barbarian subclasses that has customization options, as well as a few non-combat abilities that you can pick up to augment your Barbarian's ability in exploration sh scenarios, as well as even some role-playing scenarios too. This combined with the raw force of nature power that the Barbarian brings to the table is excellent for players that want to have a relatively straightforward but incredibly rewarding character to play. So today we're going to look at our ability scores, what races or ancestries we might take a look at to build a Totem Warrior Barbarian, what feats we might want to choose, and there's not many choices to make along the way, but the Totem Warrior does present one of the only Barbarian subclasses that does have choices, so we're going to talk about what those different Totem choices are and how they might impact your playstyle. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get rolling. Any Totem Warrior Barbarian is going to start off with a great package that is at the core of the Barbarian. You're going to have full martial weapon proficiency, proficiency in medium armor, that big beefy D12 hit die, as well as the iconic Barbarian class features. These include rage, unarmored defense, fast movement, all of the goodies that you need to really run into combat and slay your enemies. And the Totem Warrior subclass is just going to add extra pieces to that that just amplify what a Barbarian is already good at. The unique aspect of the Totem Warrior Barbarian is that at 3rd level, 6th level, and 14th level, you get to choose a totem that augments the way that your Barbarian works. These totems are all associated with an animal such as a bear, eagle, or elk, and you aren't beholden to pick the same totem as you level up. Just because you chose the bear at third level, you could choose the eagle at sixth level and the elk at 14th level. You can mix and match these as you level up to get the desired effect that you're looking for in your barbarian. Perhaps you want the early level option that makes you more robust and better to stand on the front lines, but at later levels, you might like the idea of flying. So being able to pick and choose really makes every totem warrior different unless you're all choosing the bear totem, which most of us are. <laughs> In addition to these features, many often forget that as a totem barbarian, you do actually get a little bit of ritual spellcasting abilities as you level up. At third level, you can actually cast Speak with Animals and Beast Sense, and at 10th level, you'll be able to cast Commune with Nature as well. These are all cast as rituals, but it's a very unique feature, a spellcasting feature that a barbarian gets and one that you explicitly can't use in combat, but that it is pretty useful for having in your back pocket. I've actually seen several Totem Warrior Barbarians in play, and a lot of them have used those small abilities to really augment exploration or even social encounters by just being able to commune with certain aspects of nature, talk to animals, or, or just discover things in the environment around them. So with all these class features in mind, let's actually take a look at the ability scores and ancestries that we might choose for our Totem Warrior Barbarian. And many of their class features are geared towards the strength ability score or attacks made using melee weapons with strength-based attacks or heavy weapons or, or what have you. So in I think for us, we're not going to buck any trends here. We're going to max out our strength score, I think. If we're using point by, that's going to be a 15 in strength. And I also think the other great feature of a barbarian is their ability to withstand damage, especially if you're playing a totem warrior. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But all barbarians are great damage sponges. They love being on the front lines, taking hits, especially when they're raging and they don't take the full damage. So we want to make sure that we have a robust pool of hit points to pull from, which means our constitution, we're probably also gonna max out and put a 15 in that. Now, when it comes to our dexterity score, this is actually a relatively important tertiary attribute for barbarians 
depending really on how much you care about your armor class and initiative. Barbarians are only proficient in light and medium armor. And while you do get your unarmored defense class feature, this feature allows you to use your constitution modifier in addition to your dexterity modifier together to determine your armor class. So your AC is always going to factor in your dexterity. For this reason, I find it's quite beneficial as a barbarian to actually go for a dexterity of 14 because this allows you to get the maximum benefit if you choose to wear medium armor. And if you decide to run into battle naked, it gives you a pretty decent baseline. <laughs> At this point, you probably don't have a lot of points left in your point by pool to spend on your mental ability stats, and we wouldn't blame you for dumping all of them and putting an eight in each one. <laughs> but with a few extra points to toss around, you could kind of choose which one of these three you feel like being slightly better in, whether you want to be the charismatic leader, the wise nature explorer, or the intelligent book smart barbarian why not so there's an avenue to go depending on how you imagine role playing your character now we are going to get a standard benefit from most ancestries now where we get a plus two bonus to put in one ability score and a plus one to put in another i personally am going to bump the strength up to 17 and bump the constitution up to 16 here um, if you're playing another ancestry like a mountain dwarf that gets two plus twos hey, that's even better. Um, or if you're playing a different character that might have um, a couple plus ones to throw around, I would still probably put them in strength and constitution. But you could consider some, having a higher dexterity score or boosting up one of your mental ability scores if you want to have better saving throws. I think that with the way ancestries and races are going in D&D &D and the fact that we're kind of blowing it wide open, that you can really pick what you want, I think that it is worth mentioning some of the iconic options that have some really cool additional features mm -hmm. that might make your barbarian more robust. I think that the dwarfs have their dwarven resilience feature, which even when you're not raging, you can't get surprised by poison, so that's nice. Well, many people might reach for the mountain dwarf right away to get two plus twos to their ability score increases. If you're moving around your attributes, playing a hill dwarf with plus two in strength and plus one in constitution by, again, customizing the ability scores, is going to let you pick up that amazing trait that gives you extra hit points just for being a hill dwarf. And so the hill dwarf can actually end up having more hit points in the long run than the mountain dwarf does. I think that dwarves are iconic, but I also think that we should make an argument here for half-orcs have some incredible yeah. features. Yeah. Half-orcs have the feature Relentless Endurance, which, although it's really, really hard to knock a barbarian out, if they do go down, the rest of the party is usually pretty scared that their big meat shield just went down in battle. Having Relentless Endurance, which allows you to stand back up, after being reduced to zero hit points, is going to be that amazing moment for the Barbarian, where even after the dragon thinks that they killed it, it stands back up and chops their head off. Another classic option is the Goliath, which I think is really great if you really want to put the athleticism and the strength into your Barbarian. Something about playing that giant ancestry, being larger than life, being able to pick up, carry anything, have all those extra athletic features is a lot of fun and really enjoyable and i think the goliath might be increasingly more iconic thanks to characters like grog strongjaw i also think the notion of a warforged barbarian is super cool and i really like the the, the package of traits that the warforged brings to playing the barbarian overall of course, if none of these suit your style, you could always pick up the gnome and make a gnome barbarian. And I just think that there's something really fun about grabbing a small, not typical character and making them a raging barbarian. At this point, we'll want to pick up a couple skills for our barbarian. I always am a fan of just taking proficiency in the athletic skill. I usually like to have perception or survival, but you can pick and, and choose whichever skills you speak to you as your barbarian, because once you've got athletics, you've got the one that really connects with your primary ability score. Although it can be a little bit fun to have acrobatics or even stealth on a barbarian. Now, when it comes to equipment, we do have the option of picking up some armor, but we also have our unarmored defense option, which allows us to get an AC of 15, which is actually better than grabbing a set of hide armor. If we later have access to some of the better medium ar armor options, like a breastplate or half plate or any of those options, 
that'll actually give us better AC than if we were just relying on our unarmored defense. So it really is kind of a toss up on which one of these you want to use, either equipping yourself with decent medium armor, which will benefit from your dexterity score, or if you want to use your unarmored defense. In order to beat wearing half plate armor, you actually are going to have to use your ability score increases to get your constitution to 20, and if you can, maybe even bump up that dexterity score. When it comes to choosing your weapon, this is a style choice. We're going to talk about some feat combinations built around a barbarian that uses a maul, a greatsword, or a halberd, as well as a dual wielding barbarian, because there's actually options that are pretty strong for all of these. You could also opt for a sword and board barbarian because shields do stack with unarmored defense. But I think with the, the, the totem barbarian, we do want to have that damage dealing capability. And I think a two handed weapon or a dual wielding choice is probably the way that I would go before going sword and board. So let's talk about those choices of what weapon we're going to use in conjunction with some of the feet options that we are going to yep. look at as we level up. The first one that we want to talk about is what we're calling the mauler style. This is where you have the two handed maul, where you're going to be bashing people around the battlefield. If you take that, obviously there's some really great options right out the bat with Great Weapon Master because you're having a two-handed weapon and that's immediately going to bump up your damage potential with this character. Barbarians do so well with Great Weapon Master because their Reckless Attack class feature allows them to automatically gain advantage on their melee attack rolls, which greatly compensates for the minus five penalty of Great Weapon Master. So you can really dish out a lot of damage and still keep your accuracy relatively good when you use this combination. Using a Maul, I would take this feat right away at level four. Um, or if you're playing an Ancestry that does grant you a feat at level one, I would do it at level one. Um, I would then go on to take the Crusher feat. Not only does the feat give you plus one to strength or con, allowing us to round up our con to 18 at level eight, but the extra critical effect, as well as the ability to knock your foes around with a little bit of force movement, just gives you a little bit more tactical flexibility on the battlefield as a barbarian. And that little bit of an extra push really can pay dividends over the course of a single combat encounter and really make you feel like your barbarian has much more of a battlefield presence. Beyond that, I think that it's going to be important to up your strength as high as you can. So you're going to want to put probably a plus two into strength at the next opportunity. And from there, it really is up to you how you want to build that character further. The main idea with the Maul is to get Great Weapon Master and Crusher, and that's going to be your bread and butter. As we move on to the idea of either using a great sword or a halberd or glaive, we come to, again, we're going to see a trend here that Great Weapon Master is probably still the first feat that you want yeah. to get. If you can get it at level 1, go for it. If not, you're grabbing it at level 4. Anytime you're using a big two-handed weapon with a Barbarian, you want Great Weapon Master just to up that damage potential. And again, as Monty said, it pairs so well with Reckless Attack that it really does something with a Barbarian that no other class in the game can benefit from as much. Great Weapon Master is always a bit of a toss-up when you take it because you're getting a minus 5 to hit for a plus 10 to damage. But when you're always rolling with advantage, then it's not as much of a problem. With the Greatsword style, you could consider the Slasher feat instead. This is also going to give you the plus 1 bonus to your strength that you want, but it's also going to give you the ability to reduce an enemy's speed by 10 feet, making it harder for them to get away from you, as well as also having that other critical effect as well. I like to combine Slasher with Sentinel, and this can re result in a Barbarian that is surprisingly sticky and dangerous at the same time, as now you can both stop your foe's movement, but even if you don't successfully stop, their, stop your foe's movement with Sentinel, even though you attack them on your last turn, that's going to reduce their speed as well. This is where if you do complete this combo by taking Polar Master, you can really feel like an interesting strategic battlefield controller while also kind of having the best damage output that you can get with a Barbarian. Um, but again, it depends on really how far you want to take that because as soon as you're adding Sentinel, Slasher, Polar Master, and Great Weapon Master, you're not going to be able to take all of those feats and max your strength until the very end of your character's career. So consider carefully the order that you take these feats in. 
And of course, if you are grabbing Polar Master, this isn't going to work if you are wielding a greatsword. That is if you are wielding a halberd or glaive. Um, but it is a really cool option. The last option that we're looking at is the dual wielder. Now, we are going to take a bit of a different path here, and we're not going to focus on Great Weapon Master because we want two hand axes that we're going to be running into battle with. But to really make that sing on the Barbarian, I would look at feats like Fighting Initiate. By choosing the two weapon fighting style, you can now add your strength to the offhand attack, which makes this a much more potent build. Barbarians don't normally get a fighting style, which I have my own arguments about, but this feat will allow them to do it. Then you can follow along with the classic dual wielder feat. So now instead of having to use light weapons, you can actually use heavier weapons like battle axes or long swords to dual wield. You could even then use war hammers and bring in crusher or slasher just as before. It's a great way to make your barbarian feel a little bit different and it's totally possible. The dual wielder might, you might also be tempted to take levels of fighter to get the fighting style faster, but overall I think that this works quite nicely and you end up with the ability to choose a feat of your choice by the end of the build, as well as still being able to max your strength. So the dual wielder can be a very nice option, particularly if you don't wanna go the standard beaten path of the cookie cutter great weapon master barbarian. <laughs> Now there are some other feat options that are really excellent on a Barbarian, but it might be hard to squeeze them in if you're going for one of these specific builds. If you look at feats like Alert, which just makes it so that your Barbarian can't be surprised and you get a bonus to your initiative, that can be really helpful on a Barbarian. We also have great choices like Martial Adept that allow us to take a Battlemaster maneuver, which gives us a little bit more flexibility with what our Barbarian can do on its turn in combat. You can add in like a trip attack or a shoving attack or a disarming strike or really any of the iconic options. In addition, you might really look at your Barbarian's wisdom saving throw and be very scared of wizards. So you could take resilient wisdom uh, or any for the, any of the other mental ability scores. And you might even want to add a dash of magic by taking a feat like Shadow Touched or Fey Touched. It could be really cool to have invisibility or Misty Step on your Barbarian but it might be harder to justify taking these feats when you get so much for the more martially focused ones. So with all that in mind, let's take a look at the actual choices that we make as we level up our Barbarian. Now, in the case of the Totem Warrior Barbarian, it's choosing our totems at third, sixth, and 14th level. So let's start with the third level option. So let's start things off with the first one listed, the bear in the room, the one that everybody's talking about, the bear totem barbarian. The bear totem allows you, while you're raging, to gain resistance to all damage except psychic damage. That's it, and that's all you need to know to realize that, hey, a barbarian that takes the totem of the bear is taking half damage on pretty much everything except for those nasty psychic enemies which are few and far between and a barbarian that takes half damage on everything you already have one of the biggest pools of hit points in the game and you're essentially doubling that now not to poke the bear but it's worth noting that barbarians of all stripes who are raging have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. There are so many combat encounters where these are the only damage types the bad guys are going to be throwing at you. And so, unless you're regularly having fights where there are lots of spellcasters throwing around magic damage, or creatures with poison damage or fire damage, the, the benefits of the bear totem might not actually be benefits at all. They don't do anything in encounters unless you are facing non-weapon based damage types. And it's worth noting as well that resistances to common damage types like poison and fire or cold are on many of the ancestries that we just mentioned. So a dwarf with poison resistance innately is already going to have resistances while they're raging against the vast majority of monster damage types. and. Getting resistance to a specific damage type is as easy as quaffing back a potion or having a specific suit of armor. So it's not that the bear totem isn't great. It is. But you can go entire adventures without actually benefiting from it. And I think one of the problems that we see with the totem warrior barbarian is that everybody that plays one says, Oh my god, the bear totem, let's just take that and never even read the other ones. Mm -hmm. 
and we're here to say that it might be worth reading the other ones. Let's take a look. With the Totem of the Eagle, as long as you're raging, you can dash as a bonus action and all opportunity attacks now have disadvantage on you. This kind of allows you to maneuver through the battlefield much easier than you would as really any other type of barbarian. Dashing as a bonus action is amazing on a barbarian. And barbarians already have an improved speed feature. So the yeah. worst thing is a barbarian is not being able to close the distance to your foes. And so being able to, da this is like doubling your speed. Yeah, and I think that this this is a great choice that I think is underutilized because of how amazing the bear totem is. But the eagle is actually really awesome if you want to have that maneuverability. Now, disadvantage on attacks isn't quite as cool as something like the mobile feat, which allows you to just disengage from any enemy that you attacked. But it still means that majority of people are going to miss you. Now, there is the option that if you are taking reckless attack a lot and then trying to disengage, that it all kind of evens out in the wash. It's still a good defensive perk. I mean, at the end of the yeah. day, if you if you are getting hit on your way out, you're taking half damage anyway because you're raging. So it's you're you're going to be a good meat shield no matter what. Now, the elk totem increases your walking speed by 15 feet while you're raging. This does make you super speedy. This can be better than the Eagle Totem if you're using your bonus action for other things, such as if you're a Polar Master or Dual Wielder. But if you are not using your bonus action regularly, then the Eagle Totem will give you a faster baseline boost of speed. Because as a Barbarian, if you have a 30 foot movement speed base, plus your fast movement, your 40 foot movement, and when then when you dash, you're covering 80 feet. Contrast that to the Elk, where then you're not spending your bonus action, but you're moving 55 feet. So it's a bit of a toss up, but I kind of feel like the Eagle, I think the Eagle's the way I would go between these two. I agree with you. I think that the Eagle is the better option here. As we move on to the Tiger, I actually think that this is one of the weaker options. And it sucks because Tigers are a really cool animal to have yeah. as your totem. What the Tiger totem does is it increases your uh, your long jump by 10 feet and your high jump by 3 feet. I, I, I That might be useful, but I find the uses of that are very niche. I would rather, as a DM have my player not choose that and just toss them some boots of striding and springing. Yeah, which are going to have a much bigger impact on your ability to jump. Absolutely. And what a cool magic item for your barbarians. And and I think that the adding the 10 feet or the 3 feet just isn't enough to really make it feel like it's worth as much as the eagle or the bear. Now, the wolf totem is really unique. When you're raging, your allies get advantage on attack rolls that are on against enemies within five feet of you. This is basically like you're turning into the instigator of pack tactics. And I have to say, if you are in a party with other melee attackers, especially if you are fighting alongside a paladin or a rogue, it is so good, this ability. I, I also think that the wolf is probably one of the least talked about awesome options here, yeah. especially for teamwork. A lot of barbarian players, again, they see bear, they see eagle, which are very self-centered plays. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But what wolf does is it really opens up camaraderie and teamwork in a really beautiful way that can actually have a really big effect if your party knows what's going on. If you tell your party, hey, when I'm attacking a creature, you all get advantage to come in and attack it as well, that's great. If you have those other martial characters that can get toe-to-toe, -to -toe, even if you have a monk, an artificer, a ranger, a druid who uses shillelagh, a cleric who has their mace and can run in and smack people, anybody who does a little bit of melee damage is going to benefit a lot from the option of having advantage on those attacks. Yeah, it is worth noting that this doesn't work on ranged attacks. So before you get excited about teaming up with a Gloomstalker or a Sniper or or a fighter that uses an archery fighting style, unfortunately it is re required to be only melee attacks. So if you are in a group where you are the only melee combatant, this is not worth it at all. Uh, but I think that if you have one other good melee fighter, um, it's strongly worth considering. And if there are two other melee characters in your party, this is definitely a no-brainer and you should strongly consider it. 
Now, as we move on to level six, we're gonna get the same list of animals, but with new features. Again, you don't have to pick the same animal you picked at third level, you can mix and match these. It's really interesting that at sixth level, these features move away from combat, which is actually one of my favorite things about the Totem Warrior Barbarian, is it allows us to explore options outside of combat to improve different aspects of the game for a Barbarian player. The bear totem is going to double your carrying capacity and give you advantage on strength checks to pick up heavy things. Kind of a bit of a double down if you're a goliath already. Not bad. Not necessarily my first pick though here. With the eagle totem, you can now see up to a mile without any difficulty. They basically say in the text here that seeing up to a mile, you can even pick up fine details as if you were a hundred feet away. Not only that, but you no longer are impeded by dim light for the purpose of perception checks. This is actually a really cool ability for being the scout of the party, being able to have eagle eye vision to see a mile away. As a DM, I would probably constantly forget about this ability <laughs> and my player would be like, what's happening a mile away up at that camp over there? And realizing that they have the ability, I'd have to be like, oh no, they can see everything going on. It's, it's just a cool way to just Im improve the visibility for your barbarian and be that scout, be the eyes of your party. Choosing the elk doubles your overland travel speed, whether you're on foot or mounted. And this benefit actually extends to your traveling companions as well. I think this one is very campaign dependent. If you're going on like a hiking campaign across the world, then it might be cool. Yeah. Uh, but if you're doing a campaign placed in one city, then maybe not. Maybe not. Um, on the other hand, the tiger comes roaring back here, giving you proficiency in two skills from athletics, acrobatics, stealth, and survival. If you are not sure what to pick, <laughs> pick this one. More skills, more better. With the wolf, while traveling at a fast pace, you can still track creatures. And while traveling at a normal pace, you can still use stealth. Again, I think that if you are in, in a campaign that involves a lot of travel time where you are tracking creatures or you need to use stealth while traveling faster through the ruins of Drakenheim, perhaps, <laughs> then maybe the wolf is a really cool option. I do think, though, that the tiger and the eagle are actually my two... Mm prime choices out of the level six options. Eye of the Tiger versus Eye of the Eagle. Now, as we come to the 14th level options, we have, again, the same list of animals. So let's start with the bear. The bear is going to, as in most cases, double down on your ability to be a tank on the battlefield. When you use the bear totem feature here, while you're raging, all creatures within five feet of you have disadvantage against attacks on creatures other than you unless they can't be frightened. And I think that last stipulation is actually the, the, the one point against this one. I still think it's a really cool feature, but there's a lot of creatures that are immune to fear mm. and so are immune to this ability. This is a great tanking feature because it basically lets you protect your allies by imposing disadvantage on your enemies. There's no saving throw to resist this. If you're raging and you're beside an enemy, they attack your friends with disadvantage. It's awesome if you want to be that tank, and it definitely doubles down with the earlier bear feature of protecting you from incoming damage. And it part pairs really well with the wolf feature of gaining pack tactics for your yes, allies. Yes, it, it does. Yeah, both of those things. Actually, you just being there, all, all of a sudden, advantage switched on for your allies, disadvantage switched on for your enemies. Pretty good combo, actually. And again, there's, there's no save. There's no way to not get, be affected by this except to move away from you. Or if they have, yeah. uh, or if they have resistance to fear. Unfortunately, the next one really soars above because the eagle gives you a flying speed while you're raging. The only stipulation with this one is that the flying speed stops at the end of your turn. So you can't stay aloft in midair, turn to turn to turn. You have to drop back down to the ground. As a famous astronaut once said, it's not flying, it's falling with style. Um, I think this is really cool, actually, again, when combined with the lower level eagle feature, because then you can dash and really cover the distance. But a lot of flying foes, you, especially at high levels of play, they're not coming back down to earth. They're staying up there in the air and they're going to stay. They, they might often be flying 60, 70, 100 feet in the air, which means that if you have to land every time, 
you're not getting back to them. I will say that the are um, I will say that a point for this though is that oftentimes with a big creature, let's say the iconic dragon, my goal isn't to fly up, hit the dragon, fly back down and land. It's to fly up, hit the dragon and land on the dragon. So if you do have that opportunity, I do think flying still presents um, an out of combat option to solve so many problems. It does, but once again, the flying speed is equal to your current walking speed. And as a barbarian, you are going to be pretty good at jumping and covering distances in a lot of other athletic-based ways. So I don't think the Eagle Totem at 14th level is necessarily a slam dunk. It's really good, but it does have a big limitation that makes it not the automatic choice. The Elk Totem at this level is actually a really unique feature that is a bit of a trample attempt. While you're raging, you can use a bonus action to move through the space of a large or smaller creature. That creature now needs to make a strength saving throw or be knocked prone and take 1d12 plus your strength modifier in damage. So essentially, you get to run people down, knocking them over and trampling over them. What's really cool is that this is done as a bonus action and it isn't dependent on you taking the attack action. So you could trample over somebody at the start of your turn knock them prone, and now attack them with advantage without needing to reckless attack them. This is also bonus action damage as well. You could run somebody down and not even attack them if you, for some reason you didn't want to do that. Um, but it really has a lot of interesting uses and applications, and fundamentally, it's letting you make an attack as a bonus action. Pretty good. Speaking of weaponizing your bonus action, the Tiger Totem is going to allow us, while raging, if we move 20 feet in a straight line and end that movement in melee range of an enemy, we can use a bonus action to make an additional melee attack against that target. So now, as long as you're charging into battle, you get to do your attacks and then an extra attack. This actually makes a case against our earlier conversation on being a dual wielder or being a polar master. If you are thinking of taking the elk or the tiger, mind you, you are waiting for 14th level. So you kind of have to wait a long time to weaponize your bonus action. But at that point, you might not be using the polearm feature or the dual wielder feature as much. You know what you could take instead though? Mobile. Because with mobile, not only are you getting that extra 10 feet to your movement speed, which is stacking with your fast movement, which is going to help you. Basically, you start your turn, you attack somebody, and now the mobile feet prevents them from making an opportunity attack against you. So you, now you just back up and then run right back at them and attack as a bonus action. So by simply taking the mobile feet along with this, you have a very reliable combo to weaponize your bonus action that doesn't require you to use an offhand weapon or you take polearm master. Just You're just kind of slamming yourself back into them over and over again. And there's not really anything that they can do to stop that with the mobile feet in yep. and tied no. with this. You're just constantly running out, running in every turn. Yeah. So this is like kind of golden if you have mobile. With the Totem of the Wolf, you can knock a creature prone when you hit it with a melee weapon attack. Uh, there's no save for it. As long as they're large or smaller, they just get knocked prone. Which is really incredible because now you don't need to use Reckless Attack to gain advantage. And technically, if you're not using the earlier Totem of the Wolf, you are giving the other melee combatants that are nearby advantage on the target yeah. you just knocked prone. So it's interesting that I actually wouldn't take the wolf and wolf because they kind of contrast each other. But this is a really good addition to some of the other features that might help out your party in gaining advantage. Yeah. These 14th level features are all pretty good. And it's kind of interesting because the elk is like a weird hybrid of the wolf and the tiger. Yeah. It's kind of giving you a little bit of both options, which makes it pretty strong in that respect. And I could also see building your character around any of any of these choices. They just come online a little bit late, so they're kind of more capstones than things that you can kind of build your character around early on. But do they all give you a really transformative way of playing your character? Absolutely. So they give you more options, which I think is a great thing to have in a high-level feature. So with all of those choices in mind, I think that you can really build the Totem Warrior Barbarian in many different ways, choosing what type of weapon you're going to use and what totems you're going to use, what feats you're going to take. 
It actually gives one of the most versatile options for barbarians out there and is a ton of fun to play. You're probably never going down in battle and you're going to take a lot of people with you if you do. So this has been a look at how to play the Path of the Totem Warrior Barbarian in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you've played one of these iconic characters, let us know about it in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube and Twitch and elsewhere, please consider becoming a supporter of our channel by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play in the worlds of Draconine, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we got plenty more class guides for D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.